This week on Vaticano, we follow Pope Francis on his visit to the President of the Italian Republic at the Quirinale Palace. For 300 years, this palace was the actual residence of the popes in Rome. Cardinals and bishops from Venezuela come to the Vatican to meet with the Pope and discuss the difficult situation their country is currently facing. Stay with us to admire the Raphael frescoes in a new light. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On Sunday, June the 11th, Pope Francis prayed the Angelus Prayer from the window of the Apostolic Palace. According to the Vatican Gendarmerie, around 15,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square for this Marian prayer with the Pope. This Sunday's Angelus fell on the Feast of the Holy Trinity, and in his catechesis, the Holy Father explained that the identity of God is a relationship of love between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Christian community despite its human limitations, can become a reflection of the communion of the Trinity, of its goodness and of its beauty. Pope Francis explained that we will be able to fully experience the Holy Trinity when we go to heaven and ask the Virgin Mary to help us enter more into this Trinitarian communion. Amen. After the Angelus, the Holy Father mentioned that the day before, Saturday, in the Italian city of La Spezia, Itala Mella was beatified. Blessed Mella was raised in a family far from the faith, and she had professed herself to be an atheist, but later converted after an intense spiritual experience. May the testimony of the new blessed encourage us during our days to often turn our thoughts to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live in the cell of our heart. On Saturday, June the 10th, Pope Francis paid a visit to the President of the Italian Republic, Sergio Mattarella, at the Quirinale Palace in Rome. The President welcomed the Pope and showed him the chapels of the Presidential Palace. A lot of church history has taken place within these walls. For 300 years, the Quirinale Palace was the actual residence of the popes in Rome. All through its history, the palace has housed 30 popes, four conclaves, four kings of Italy, and now the 12th president of the Italian Republic. Pope Francis prayed briefly with President Mattarella at the Annunciation Chapel. The two leaders discussed the current issues of migration, the difficult situation some Italian families face, and the future of the youngest generations of Italians. I look to Italy with hope. It's a hope rooted in grateful memory of its parents and grandparents, who include my own, because my roots too are in this country perché le mie radici sono in questo paese. Pope Francis spoke about the church in Italy, which is strongly linked to the soul of the country, and about the fundamental values that were transmitted by his predecessors. La chiesa in Italia Here in Italy, the church is a vital reality, strongly linked to the soul of the country and to the feeling of the people. The Church lives the people's joys and sorrows and tries, as much as it can, to comfort them and strengthen their social bonds and to help everybody build the common good. At the end of his speech, the Holy Father said that in the Catholic Church and in the principles of Christianity, Italy will always find the best ally for the growth of society, for its concord and for its true progress.
On Friday, June the 9th, Pope Francis met with participants in the plenary assembly of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. This year, the Council has been discussing the role of women in interfaith relations on the theme, the role of women in education towards universal fraternity. Reflecting on the subject you addressed, I would like to pause in particular on three aspects. To appreciate woman's role, to educate to fraternity, and to dialogue. The Holy Father stressed the importance of recognizing vital skills women possess, listening, welcoming, and openness to others, and concluded by saying that these values are key to the work done for interreligious dialogue. Due to the dramatic situation of the country, the first week of June, some members of the Bishops' Conference of Venezuela came to Rome to meet with the Pope. During the meeting, they discussed with the Holy Father the humanitarian crisis that is devastating the country, and they showed him documents attesting to this, including the list with names of more than 70 victims who have lost their lives in the recent protests. We saw him really moved. He thought about it a long time. But we also saw in him the certainty that as the Episcopal Conference we have all his support, all the support of the Holy See, and that he's close to the Venezuelan people and they can count on his support. Bishop Diego Padron told media about the meeting with the Pope and he stressed the fact that the country is currently experiencing an unprecedented state of humanitarian crisis. The world's attention has been drawn to Venezuela because the situation is grim. We are in the grip of a humanitarian crisis in all its aspects. There's a shortage of food and medicines. The people are suffering. Their economic and social conditions are really harsh. They don't have money to buy things. They don't have jobs. There's no security. The people are not respected and not consulted either. For instance, now with the Constituent Assembly, the government has decided to exclude the people, and this cannot be accepted. In today's world, this cannot be accepted, because it means that the government is no longer a democracy, but a dictatorship. They met with the Pope on Thursday, June the 8th, and on the following Sunday, June the 11th, the Archbishop of Merida, Cardinal Baltasar Porras, took possession of his church in Rome. It's a church dedicated to the saints John the Evangelist and Petronius. After Mass, the Venezuelan Cardinal expressed his personal view over the crisis affecting the country. One of the things that the government has tried to do is to split all the institutions, so that it would seem that the Pope is on one side and us on the other. As the Holy Father said, the Church is one and we are united working for life and the dignity of human beings, and for all the positive and negative effects that this globalized world has in other countries. The suffering of the Venezuelan people has crossed the natural borders of the country and is now the attention of the entire world. For this reason, the Cardinal didn't hesitate and gave a message of hope to all those affected. You can never lose hope. We are, as human beings, the ones who have sown these evils too. It's then up to us, helped by God's grace, to overcome these evils so that joy, happiness and hope can not only stay, but flourish, above all, for the new generations. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano.
I'm Alan Holdren here in Rome for Vaticano, Ida Weekend's program that we make from the Vatican. I'm here with Father Julian Caron, the author of this new book in English called Disarming Beauty and the head of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation. Thank you for being with us, Father. Thank you very much. So this book, uh, Father, seeks to diagnose the challenges in society today and offer a Catholic perspective on how to engage them. Can you tell us just briefly what are these challenges? Uh, these challenges are all before us, no? the confusion, the misunderstanding of the reality, the kind of uh, um, the wilderness in which we are uh, surrounded everywhere. No? And everybody is looking for something in which uh, they can understand what is happening in, in, in the society uh, in order to uh, understand better what is the way of dealing with these kind of challenges today. So we're talking about uh, things that affect every aspect of life, from birth to death, uh, to also family life, terrorism, everything. Everything, everything that you have mentioned. And, and all of this is a process that comes about through secularization. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how you speak of faith, truth and freedom, how does this process of secularization of life without God, how does this affect uh, people today? No, the, the effects are all these that we are mentioned because the secularization is the effect uh, of this kind of loss of meaning you know, that many people around the world today have. And without this meaning, family life or uh, living together in a society or uh, education um, process or uh, the relations in international relationship with the, among the nations all are uh, related to this kind of secularization because we don't have the, the common ground that we had before to face these kind of challenges. And you speak specifically about these challenges in Europe. Can you give us a concrete example of something that's taking it's, place it's, now? It's, it's not only in, in, in Europe. Uh, we have the, the, the same challenge. We have seen the same challenge in the United States election for the president. We have the same challenge in Latin American countries or in Russia and, no, world or in China. All this kind of, for not to say in the Middle East, no? all the nations are in front of this kind of challenges in one way or another, according to their specific uh, characteristic. But all the world today are uh, without uh, knowing how to deal together with the crisis, with the risk that all of us uh, are trying to face. No? We can see in the last meeting, international meeting here in Italy, uh, the G7, no? in which we can see the difficulty to uh, arrive to a kind of agreement in the most important issues that the world has today. Mm -hmm. And what are you proposing through this book? You're proposing beauty to counter these ugly parts of life. The, the process, the, the, what I am proposing is uh, what is the meaning of Christian faith to answer to all these kind of questions. For many, uh, maybe are, is only uh, some kind of ingenuity no? to propose Christian faith to face this kind of um, lack of meaning of life. But I think that if we can offer uh, then uh, our way of conveying Christian faith in an attractive way, they can find uh, the answer on many of these issues uh, in, the, in the Christian encounter because uh, Christianity offers an opportunity to reawaken people, 
to meet together with another, to not to deal with the other only as an enemy and not as something that is a good for, for the relationship that no other uh, can offer like this. And you propose that around the person of Christ, an encounter with the person of Christ. And you ask specifically in your book, is a new beginning possible? Is it? I think so. Christianity started uh, centuries ago in a pluralistic society, in a multicultural uh, environment. And he started again and again without any kind of power, without any kind of influence other than witness. No, the testimony of Christian life to change the world. I think it is possible always in this new beginning. Thank you so much, Father Carron. Thank you. No health without peace for Palestinians and Palestine refugees was the theme of this panel discussion on May 24th at the Intercontinental Geneva Hotel, Switzerland, co-organized by the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East and the World Health Organization. And, and just to underline what the Palestinian patient who needs referral services in East Jerusalem needs to undergo, there is, we did this uh, infographic just to underline that there is nine steps that they need to undergo in terms of administrative uh, requirements in order to obtain eventually a security permit from, from Israeli authorities. The event took place on the sidelines of the 17th World Health Assembly. The panel presented the impact caused by conflicts, blockade and occupation on the health of Palestinians and Palestine refugees in camps. The, the problem of Palestinian camps started really uh, 69 years ago by the occupation of Palestine and uh, at that time one part of the Palestine that started or called Israel. And since that time many Palestinians are living in the camps with a very bad uh, situation. 2017 is a sad year for Palestine refugees. It marks 50 years since the beginning of the Israeli occupation, 10 years since the blockade imposed on Gaza, and seven years of the war in Syria. At the same time, we have to speak also about the discriminating wall, that also the only wall in the world that divided or isolated more than 300,000 Palestinians. Our world is facing 65.3 million forcibly displaced people, in addition to some 5 million Palestine refugees, and nearly 34,000 people are forcibly displaced every day. Anyhow, uh, regardless of the health situation in Palestine, regardless or in spite of all these obstacles, in spite of all these problems, we succeeded to overcome many of these problems by having best indicators in the region. And this is thanks for our understanding, thanks for the international community, thanks for UN agencies, thanks also for the people supporting Palestine. The UN Sustainable Development Goal number three, to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, seems not to apply to everyone. And then there is the UN Goal number 16, the Peace Goal. Because in the absence of peace, as is the case in the Middle East, there will be no health. One cannot expect to eliminate health inequities and secure the basic human rights for the most vulnerable populations if one sits back and let injustice reign. The Holy See is on the forefront when it comes to support Palestine and the peace process. In January this year, the Palestinian embassy to the Holy See was inaugurated. A signal of the Pope's love for Palestine, said President Abbas. The two leaders spoke privately of the contribution of Catholics in Palestine and discussed their promotion of human dignity and assistance for those most in need, especially in the fields of education, health and aid. I want to say that the church in particular is supporting Palestinian, uh, Caritas uh, charity, they are supporting Palestinian. Uh, many uh, facilities uh, were uh, supported, health facilities, by the church directly. 
And when we are speaking about social problems, when we are speaking about uh, psychosocial problems, when we are speaking about handicaps and disability, these are supported directly by the church in many places, Melissa and Gaza and West Bank. Thank you very much. It remains to be seen if the targets for the health of Palestinians and Palestine refugees will be met. But it definitely depends on achieving the most important goal, peace. I am committed to trying to achieve a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And I intend to do everything I can to help them achieve that goal. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. The Vatican Museums have launched a new project to illuminate their precious frescoes. This is the historic moment of the illumination of the frescoes in the Raphael rooms. These masterpieces are a treasure of world art and a figurative textbook on which generations of artists have been formed over the centuries. The rooms are among the most visited sites in the Vatican Museums, located as they are on the way to the Sistine Chapel. It was Antonio Paolucci, now former director of the Vatican Museums, who initiated this project a few years ago. And today he's presenting the fruit of this hard work. In three years, we've managed to give new lighting to both the Sistine Chapel and Raphael rooms. I think the administration of the Vatican Museums can be very proud of the result achieved. Carlo Bogani, executive project director at Osram Italia, the company which realized the project, says that it's been a long but very successful story. It's involved many different entities and experts to study and identify the right mix of color and the right spectrum needed to put the frescoes in a better light. Yes, the, the light, the new light, uh, consists in, in, a, in, a, in a high, uh, high level technology, uh, which incorporates uh, LED, uh, which incorporates incorporate specific optics, which bring uh, uh, a great uniformity on the frescoes and uh, uh, based on the color reproduction index, high color reproduction index, which is uh, quite similar to the sun. The aim was to imitate sunlight as close as possible so that visitors during the evening hours can enjoy the frescoes in their full glory. We uh, arrive at a value of about 98, and with this uh, high uh, color reproduction index, together with the high uniformity, the spectator can see really the Raffaello's uh, uh, rooms, the Raffaello painting in a new life, in a new, in a new light. And this uh, allows to, to check all the details, shape the pictures, and uh, to understand exactly uh, the meaning of the fresco. Following the visitor's path, the first room is the Hall of Constantine, not accessible now due to renovation work. The second coming up is the room of Heliodorus, with the scenes of the encounter of Leo the Great with Attila, and the expulsion of Heliodorus, and the Eucharistic miracle of Bolsena, and liberation of St. Peter. In this latter scene in particular, Raphael worked masterfully with the light, creating an extraordinary three-dimensional effect. The presentation to launch the project took place in the third room, the room of the Signatura. Here, the visitor can find a scene depicting the disputation over the Most Holy Sacrament. In the center, there's the Holy Sacrament uniting the Church in Heaven with the Church on Earth, and the proof that during Mass, there are no boundaries between Paradise and Earth. This room also contains the famous School of Athens, the cardinal and theological virtues, and a scene from Greco-Roman mythology called the Parnassus. The last room is the room of the fire in the Borgo, with frescoes representing the coronation of Charlemagne, 
the oath of Leo III, and the Battle of Ostia. The scene of the fire in the Borgo depicts an event that really happened and is recorded in Vatican documents. According to these, in the year 847, a big fire broke out in front of St. Peter's Basilica, and through his blessing alone, Pope Leo IV miraculously extinguished it, saving the people and the church. Thanks to the new LED technology, the Vatican museums have shed new light on the Raphael rooms, offering visitors a better visual experience of the frescoes. The new lighting will also help to preserve these masterpieces in a more efficient way, saving more than 70% of the energy that was used to do so before. Join us next week on Vaticano and discover the origins of the Feast of Corpus Christi. Thanks for watching.